So tonight we are listening to Dr. Liana May on pediatric fevers. Not all are created equal. She has an impressive bio as they all do. Dr. May received her medical degree from Michigan State College of Osteopathic Medicine and her master's of public health from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She completed her pediatric residency at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, followed by Pediatric Global Health Service Delivery Fellowship, sorry, in partnership with Harvard Medical School, Boston Children's Hospital, and Partners in Health. Dr. May current works clinically in the Children's Hospital of Colorado Pediatric Emergency Room and currently serves as the Associate Director of our Global Health Track here at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Minimed. Um, in addition, she's a University of Colorado School of Medicine Compass Guide, serving as a medical educator, coach, and longitudinal mentor to medical students spanning their medical school career. Dr. May has worked in nine resource-limited nations with ongoing educational work and research in Rwanda through the University of Global Health Equity and Partners in Health. Dr. May's scholarly interests include global health, medical education, mentorship, and pediatric health care capacity building through health system strengthening. I am in awe of Dr. Leanna May, and we very lovingly welcome you to our mini med session tonight. I'm Leanna, and as Joe mentioned, clinically I work in the pediatric emergency room, but half my time is spent in medical education and global health work. And so I wanted to try to take a way to weave those things together in what I presented. So uh, <laughs> no conflicts of interest to disclose. I want this to be educational and thought provoking. So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about temperature and what a true fever is, because to those of us in the profession, that number actually matters a lot. We're going to talk about stratifying fevers by age and risk and what that looks like in the U.S., and then we're going to shift gears and go from high temperatures to hypothermia or low temperatures in neonates and how this is a global burden and kind of dig into that a little bit. Through this work, we'll talk about a project I've worked on longitudinally in Rwanda to um, come up with a, a low tech solution to a large global health problem. So what do you guys think a fever is? What temperature? 101. 101, 104. Any other ideas? 100, 100, 100.2, 100.4 or greater in any capacity that you check it. Now, all ways that you check a temperature are not created equally. Uh, so especially in small babies, less than three months, a rectal temperature is the most accurate. That's because small babies have a lot of surface area and they emit uh, heat out. And so actually the core temperature could be a lot hotter than what you're reading if you take it, you know, in their mouth or in their ear. Also, ear or tympanic temperatures are not as reliable under six months. The ear canal is very tiny and you really just can't get a good accurate reading. Um, and the old kind of adage has always been, if you take an oral axillary or temporal temperature to add one degree uh, to make it kind of a equal the rectal temperature, we in the medical field don't recommend that, but it is more or less true. Uh, why do kids get fevers? So fever is a normal response to infection. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. Uh, it helps activate our immune system. It helps us actually fight off infections and in kids especially, but actually all of us, viruses are much more common than bacterial infections. So when we think about what actually causes fevers, viral infections, 95% of fevers are caused by viral infections in kids. We're talking about your common cold, croup, 99% of coughs, 90% of sore throat, and 99% of diarrhea and vomiting. Some of the exceptions to this are if you've just been on a big trip, if you've been drinking pond water, if you've just completed antibiotics. So there are a few caveats, but in general, your run of the mill diarrhea and vomiting is going to be viral. And for viral infections, antibiotics don't work because they fight bacterial infections. So what causes bacterial infections? Most ear infections, and the, the age range for that is really six months to five years old. So when I see a kid in the emergency room who falls out of that range, 
we do something now where we call the watch and wait method, where we will still send kids home with a prescription for most commonly amoxicillin, but we'll say really use Motrin and give it 48 hours because it's probably viral and with good pain control, the kids will do okay. Most sinus infections are bacterial, strep throat, pneumonia, and urinary tract infections. And those would all be reasons to, to give antibiotics. But age matters a lot. So we know in the first couple months of life, babies are very delicate. They haven't fully developed their immune system. And really the only anti or, sorry vaccines that they have on board are their hepatitis B and their vitamin K, which are usually given right after birth. Otherwise we wait to give the first set of primary immunizations at two months. Because of all these facts, they are at higher risk for severe infections. So we recommend that any temperature over 100.4 should be evaluated by a healthcare provider. Because also these small babies, and this is the, the main reason we like to see babies in this, small age, age, in this age range when they're small, is illness can be really subtle. They cannot be feeding as well. They can be difficult to console. They can be not waking up as easily. And especially in that first month of life, you're just trying to figure a baby out. So it's sometimes hard to discern what could be illness and what is, you just aren't sure what's going on. For any of you that have had children that had fevers when they were small, you probably remember because it's traumatic. I see a couple shaking heads. You Parents don't forget um, a, a septic workup of a small baby. So we call it SBI or testing for a serious bacterial infection. It, and it includes getting three types of samples blood sample because we want to look at what the white count is and what kind of cells are in the blood, urine because it's quite common to have a urinary tract infection, and cerebral spinal fluid when we're worried about meningitis. But things have changed, and so we're going to talk about some of those uh, differences, but it allows me to bring up evidence-based medicine. That's really kind of one of the cornerstones of academic medicine. And here at Children's uh, Hospital Colorado, we're the only dedicated pediatric health system within a seven state region. So we serve a lot of people that do not live in our local area through phone, airport, telemedicine, you know, flying to different sites. We have 34 regional outreach sites across a thousand mile radius. And we provide three, three dozen different type of pediatric specialties over these different regional outreach sites. Um, so at the bottom, you'll see something called clinical pathways. So like many other top children's hospitals around the country, we really want to disseminate how to treat a lot of the common things that we see for family practice doctors, uh, community emergency rooms, places where they just aren't as up to date on academic medicine and help them to be able to navigate and see kind of what our pathways are. So I pulled up this. I don't expect you to read the details or understand the flow chart, but I wanted to use this as an example. So this, uh, this clinical pathway is for fever in infants from zero to 60 days. Um, and you can see on the side, I wrote that there's a stratification of the patients into three age-based categories zero to 21 days, 22 to 28 days, and 29 to 60 days. Um, so it really allows us to treat babies that fall in these categories differently, um, which is a huge advancement. And the big new player that has really led to a lot of changes is something called procalcitonin. So I put a pretty picture of a uh, of the mechanics up there, we don't need to get into that. But it's a host response biomarker that is both sensitive and specific to bacterial infection. So in combination with checking a procalcitonin level, which is a blood test, and we're already getting blood for our other workup, it allows us to help figure out or to support earlier uh, discontinuation of antibiotics or reduce unnecessary antibiotics. So we used to do a lot more lumbar punctures on kids between that 30 to 90 day range. Now with a simple blood test, procalcitonin, we have a much better idea of where their risk is. Of course, taking some other things from this uh, algorithm into account, but it really has allowed us to do a lot less lumbar punctures and to monitor and trend this level over a couple of days when a, a small baby would still be in the hospital for that fever, but may not require the antibiotics. So kind of going back to our theme of age mattering. So greater than three months of age, the, the immune system is maturing. 
You should have the two month immunizations on board. Babies are just more resilient. And remembering that germs aren't always a bad thing. It does help the immunity system to develop. This is the one, I repeat this a lot in the emergency room and parents, especially in the middle of the night that are on viral infection, hmm, probably anything over five for that year, don't like hearing. <laughs> Eight to 10 viral infections a year is normal. And that's like pre-pandemic, the kids that you know were out and about in the world. So maybe even a little higher since then. That's a lot of viral infections. And if you think about just the change in weather and when you, people get sick, this is not like spread equally over 12 months. They're usually like back to back to back in a couple time periods in the year. And it's it's really exhausting and, and tiresome. But it's I always say you, you either pay your dues when they go to daycare or when they get to kindergarten. You're going to pay them at some point. It's just a matter of when they build that immunity. So I wanted to just talk about a couple myths about fevers that are pretty common. So fever greater than 104 causing brain damage and having a febrile seizure as a precursor to neurologic issues later in life. So fevers with infections really don't get high enough to be dangerous. To cause brain damage, you need a temperature of about 108. And our body is really hardwired to, to kind of not let you get there. Um, and you, so usually if we see a temperature that high, it's because some type of extreme environmental exposure, like, you know, a heat stroke, not because you're fighting something off. Another common question I get is, well, what if I'm treating that fever with Motrin and Tylenol? Am I going to mask it reaching a higher temperature? Serious infections, they're going to break through your Motrin and Tylenol. And we do know that those medications wear off. Tylenol you give every four hours, Motrin every six. So I would expect to see a good response. And then as you get to the end, the medicine's wearing off, the temperature will start creeping up again. Febrile seizures, something we see pretty regularly. Another thing that is very terrifying to parents. A simple febrile seizure does not cause any permanent harm, and it does not create any increased risk for developmental delays, um, nor uh, having epilepsy. So that's something that a lot of families worry about, but is not the case. So if I told you all this reassuring stuff, well, when are you supposed to worry? We do worry, like I said, any kid under uh, three months of age, they should at least be looked at. It doesn't mean that serious interventions are going to be necessary, but they just are at higher risk. And so having somebody, like I tell families, when you come to the emergency room, my job is to look at thousands of kids each year. And I have, I've developed a, a good ability to tell who's sick and who I should be worried about and who I don't need to be worried about. And, you know, as parents you're, or family members of any sort, you're not expected to be able to do that. Fever lasting more than three days over two, that's when you should start to be concerned, huh? Is it getting any better? That's why I really like truly taking temperatures. I know the easy way is to say, ah, they feel hot. It's really amazing. I, it's kind of my own little side project. I ask families, how high was the temperature? Oh, it felt to be about 103. There is no evidence that shows, even in the medical profession, that I can use the back of my hand, your lips. You can use anything and really come up with a numerical value. So it's, it's always, it helps me understand where I'm kind of a starting point with a family. Um, but and you, I mean, you often can tell when they have a fever, you treat it and it's not there anymore, but we like to know what that number is. So you can trend the curve. Is the fever over a couple of days going up? Is it staying the same or is it starting to come down? Because those things kind of help us assess our risk and determine what else needs to be done from a medical workup. A fever without a source for greater than 24 hours in that kind of six month to two year range, we start to get worried about things like a urinary tract infection or an ear infection, something we're not seeing on the outside um, that we need to do some tests or, or have an exam for to be able to look into. All right, here's some, here's some more, more reasons to worry. Uh, just the general appearance, like really trusting your gut on how your kid is doing. Like when we don't feel well, we all are crabbier or fussier than usual, but we still usually are interested to get up and drink and have something to eat. Really a lethargic or super sleepy child, that, that is concerning because kids are pretty resilient. 
The drinking is a big one. I don't care if a kid doesn't want to eat solids for a few days when they're ill, but if they're not drinking and able to hydrate themselves, that's when we can get in kind of the dehydration territory and or they're just showing signs of a more serious infection. The other way is trying to treat that fever first. If I had a dollar for every time that I see a kid in the middle of the night, that the parents find a fever, they give them the Motrin Tylenol, and then they get in the car and they come to the emergency room. And by the time they reach me, the fever has resolved, but you got to give it some time to work. Uh, so the first and most important thing is, is that you have the right dose for their weight. Uh, sometimes parents will give like, I just gave an ML or two because it just felt like I didn't need more. You got to give like the appropriate dose for it to work. And there are some general guidelines on bottles. Um, and you've got to give it a little bit of time. You know, I any kid I see in the emergency room that has a fever of 102 or over, I give them and they haven't had anything recently. I give the Motrin and Tylenol at the same time because it works faster. There's no danger in giving both medicines if you haven't given Tylenol in the last four hours or Motrin in the last six. It just kind of helps bring the temp down faster. And then you can space. You have one medicine to give at a closer interval than the other moving forward. But these are some of the danger signs or things that really should make you bring a kid in no matter how long they've had a fever or what their age is. Really complaining of a severe headache, not like a headache with a fever that's not improving lethargic, acting confused, having a stiff neck, being concerning for meningitis, difficulty breathing, a concerning rash, like not one that looks like, oh, they just have cold and a little rash, someone that won't drink or hasn't put out any urine in the past 12 hours. Those are all very concerning signs and is someone that should be evaluated quite quickly. So we just talked a lot about fever. Now we're going to kind of go to the other end of the spectrum and talk about thermoregulation and its role in infant mortality. So this study that I'm quoting is from The Lancet almost a decade ago. I think the pandemic has really hurt kind of newer research coming out on this front. So I think the numbers are probably higher now, but I, I don't have a better estimate for you. Of the 2.9 million infants who die in the first month of life, 1 million die in their first 24 hours of life. And thermal regulation plays a big part in this, especially babies that are born preterm, who are growth restricted or ill. And in developing countries, there's a lot of places where there isn't good prenatal care. People don't have adequate nutrition. So many more babies are born growth restricted. So there is, you know, this, this, there's millions and millions of babies that are at risk for these challenges. Um, and providing good thermal regulation right after birth, aside from preventing death, it also promotes nutrition and weight gain. So while we've talked about what is a true fever, hypothermia is when a body temperature drops below 36.5. And I realize you guys don't think in centigrade. That should be like, I think 96, right, Joe? I'll look at, I'm going to do the calc. Okay. Joe's going to do the math for us for a minute. Um, and so having a low temperature puts you at great, it, it may be it, in the ways that we talked about subtle signs of illness in a baby, low temperature can be another way that presents being hypothermic can show that you have an illness as well. Um, and even babies that survive sitting at these low hypothermic temperatures if they do survive, they can have stunted growth, which impairs their overall brain development. 97.7. 97.7, so even higher than, yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, I guess it's just right under 98. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But I thought maybe they'd give a little bit. I, I just think in centigrade at work, so I hadn't thought about that for a while. Um, and so, and this, I think, is the astonishing statistic. So neonatal hypothermia is estimated to occur in up to 85% of babies that end up in the hospital in low and middle income countries. That's super high. So the World Health Organization has embraced, as the, and for a long time, using kangaroo mother care um, as the best and most affordable and accessible way to address uh, thermal regulation. So as you can see in this picture, it's the mom putting those babies skin to skin right on her. So while we think at home, 
or here domestically about doing that right after birth. It helps stimulate milk production. It helps with bonding. We then usually send the baby over to the warmer to get a nice bath and to be assessed. But we're talking about places where there aren't warmers or in rural Rwanda where I worked, you might find six, six, sick babies in one uh, warmer because, you know, they only have a few and the other, the light bulbs broken and, you know, there's electricity cuts and all sorts of other complications. Um, and so the philosophy of this is putting the baby like a mother kangaroo would do for the joey in her pouch. That's where the name comes from, keeping that baby close. It's, it's cheap, it's effective, and for the same reasons that we put a baby on skin here at home, um, it helps with bonding and milk production. But there's time when kangaroo mother care isn't possible. The infant is ill. Or there's a lot of reasons why a mom is unable to provide kangaroo mother care. The mom doesn't make it through childbirth. She's too ill postpartum and is having her own medical needs taken care of. You have multiple gestation and, you know, for whatever reason, it's more babies that can fit on the mom's chest or, you know, just other logistics. Um, <laughs> Or there's other responsibilities. I mean, when we're talking about this right now, or at least the way I'm talking about it, we're talking thinking about right after birth. But we have moms, especially for low birth weight babies, they may need to per, uh, continue to use kangaroo mother care for the first weeks of life. And they may need to go home and take care of other children or work or have other reasons that they can't just have that baby attached to them all the time. So as kind of pointed out by the statistics, this is a huge global problem. Um, and there really has been a push in the last year to come up with low tech solutions for these high stake problems. Uh, I was living and working in rural Rwanda uh, with the head of the Boston Children's uh, NICU and really just seeing that this was a problem we were seeing over and over watching little babies die that shouldn't should at least have a better chance to survive. And out of that work came this infant, it originally was called the infant warming mat, has gone on to become the dream warmer, which I'll talk more about. So my mentor, if you know anything about global health is Dr. Paul Farmer, who unfortunately passed away not that long ago. Um, but I put this quote because I just love the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that's wrong with this world. Really just trying to give every individual the best shot at life. Um, so in work between Harvard Medical School, Partners in Health, the Ministry of Health with Rwanda, and uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory out in Berkeley, California, uh, we took a concept that we saw was a gap and tried to come up with a low-tech solution uh, to address that. So you can see there's been a little, this was kind of one of our early form, this is the current down in the corner is kind of the fancier packaging that they've worked to make it look a little nice, nicer and um, more ready to sell on, on the, in the market. Uh, but this operates, I described the, the tubes as like those ice pops that kids like to eat, the otter pops, sewn together in a mattress. And it's a phase change material. So uh, it goes from solid to liquid um, when it is warmed up and it will maintain a temperature of 37 degrees uh, until it kind of cools down right away to the solid phase. There's a lot of the ambient temperature, kind of what the baby and the mom's temperature are depend kind of what that length of time that it works for is, but anywhere between four and eight hours. Uh, so you take the, that long strip or the long mattress of, of strips, you roll it up and that blue canister is, it started out as we were using igloo coolers. Um, and, you know, anywhere in the world, people like to drink tea and coffee. So they have some way to make hot water. Is that on coals? If they have electricity, it's probably an electric kettle. It can look like a number of ways, but you just need hot water to make this. So you roll the mattress up, you put it in that, that cooler and you pour hot water up over it. And within 10 minutes, it reaches that 37 degrees centigrade temperature. Now it does require, uh, 10, 10 minutes to get up to speed. So it's not the immediate answer, like if a baby is being born, but you can have them ready to go if you are working in a labor and delivery type environment. Uh, this neoprene sleeve was developed just so there was something between the mattress 
and the baby. Um, and it also helps insulate it to, to kind of get a longer span um, out of the heat before uh, it starts cooling down. So you can imagine trying to develop a technology to prevent uh, African babies uh, from dying from hypothermia involving heat and the potential for burns was not easy to get through all of the uh, IRBs. It actually took me two years. It was it was a painful process, um, but it's high risk, you know, having a, a developed country try to bring in some technology. Uh, but we've been working long term in Rwanda um, and had developed long standing relationships, and those are the key tenets to good global health working: is is trust um, and long term commitment. So through the organization Partners in Health that I worked in, you can see the three regions that are in orange in the country of Rwanda. Rwanda is the most highly dense, uh, densely populated country in Africa. Um, it's about the size of Maryland um, from Kigali, where that star is, up to the northern province. Uh, it's only 70 miles, but it takes about three and a half hours because there's no paved road. Uh, but these were the areas that were the most kind of underserved in the country and where our organization partners in health worked. Uh, and through those relationships, we were able to start the phases of uh, safety and feasibility studies to kind of bring this biotech project uh, to the next level. So the other thing I want to mention is when you're working in limited resource settings, you can't expect that everyone is literate um, or can understand complicated instructions. Uh, I think this is an earlier version. This isn't of the current dream warmer, um, but these were the pictorial instructions that explain step by step how to prepare the warmer, uh, because the goal was while we were testing this in hospitals, we would like in the end for it to be able to be in very rural settings where it may be someone without medical training that is is helping to use it at the safety, effectiveness, and feasibility. The next one was the performance of the infant warmer in healthcare centers. And then the third was a much larger study. Um, but this stuff doesn't develop overnight. I mean, the idea started in 2013 and our clinical, our, our clinical trial, the third one, that where we were able to look at a larger population of patients was uh, it, it finished in late 2021. So slow going to get through something. But this was the first time that a large scale study had uh, looked at a low cost infant warming intervention anywhere in the world. Um, and it did. It demonstrated good effectiveness, safety and feasibility after a thousand uses, which was very reassuring. The thing, you know, burning babies and, you know, would people understand how to use novel technology? We were able to show a thousand times over that we could overcome those barriers and there were there were no we had no safety uh, adverse safety um, in, incidences, um, and the warmer was able to bring the temperature up to where we goal temperature of all the babies except eight percent. And there's there's complicated reasons in terms of they were just very ill or or misuse. Um, when it was used effectively, it, it really did work all of the time. So the next step for this project. Um, is to, we really wanted it to be something that was uh, able to be manufactured locally and then distributed. Uh, so there's a map kind of stemming from Rwanda to a bunch of other uh, low income countries in Africa um, that the goal is to disseminate use. And then there's also some NGOs working in Mexico, Haiti, and India that are, are looking to start kind of using this at larger scale. The idea is when you produce things in larger quantities, you can sell them at a cheaper price point. And so our, our goal had always been to create something that costs less than $20 with a minimum of 100 uh, uses of the product. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to lower middle income countries, let alone to a hospital, but they are graveyards for pieces of technology that high income countries no longer use and they give and ship and then there aren't the technicians to support them. There aren't the there isn't the education um, on how to use them properly, or just have it places where there are electricity cuts. That in and out of electricity is much harder on machines than if you were to live in a high income country where you had stable electricity. 
So I wanted to leave a little bit more time for questions because I kind of covered a broad array of topics. Um, so if anyone has any kind of questions on pediatric topics or on global health work or kind of, you know, working on biotech uh, creation in that space, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, that was amazing. Thank you, Dr. May. Yay, yay. So we'll take questions again in turn first from uh, this audience and then from anybody who is uh, watching remotely. So does anybody have any questions here? We'll bring you the microphone so that the people who are listening remotely can hear you. If you know, so I don't know. Maybe do I need to turn this one off for that? Turn it off. Yep. Um, I'm just curious if you know or can talk about other low tech bio, like things that other things that you've seen work really well. And possibly, I guess the other side of that is um, things that it would be nice if somebody created it or invented it. Yeah. Well, I was, I mean, I, I, there's lots of positive examples. The one that first comes to mind is um, one that did not work well. And I just think it's very interesting. So this was a colleague at Harvard at Mass General um, who was kind of in the same neonatal space. And so had come up with this idea of making kind of the more standard um, isolate to keep babies and using uh, Toyotas are very common around the world, um, kind of the the Land Rover. And so I had this idea, like oh, we could power this with like Land Rover engines and parts. And I mean, it sounded so great because there's so many of these cars in so many countries and was like on the cover of Time magazine. And he tells a story because at Mass General, because it's a very historic hospital in our country, there's like a museum and he would walk by his creation like every day. And he's like, it was just the ultimate reminder of my short sightedness because they got it all the way to production. And when they were really testing it, they realized no one wants to put their brand new baby in something with a dirty, dirty car parts that came, you know, from off the side of the road, which makes total sense. And like the technology worked, but like, yeah, it, it just like really had escaped them and like all the way to be on the cover of a premier magazine. So I just think that's a great example of you know, really having to think through all the pieces and why the testing and trial and, and getting, that was one of the big, in our, some of our studies was really getting um, parental feedback. Like how did the parents feel about, um, you know, using this device? Uh, because similarly, we were, you know, while there have been this, this was kind of a, a mattress type invention. There had been a similar uh, low tech solution that was putting a baby in kind of like a sleeping bag, which is great because they were staying warm and it allowed the heat in. But for all the reasons we talked about that you worry about small babies, you need to see the way they're breathing. Are they retracting? Are they breathing super fast? And if you're all zipped up in, in a, like a, a sleeping bag, you can't see any of those things. So, you know, it, it does take, and that was the really, the, the thing I love most about being on this kind of multidisciplinary team is you need engineers to think through things. I don't know anything about phase change material. You need parents who are using something to give their input. You know, you need lots of different perspectives um, for things to work well. I'm trying to think of like my favorite uh, low tech solution. So in pediatrics, because that's the world I think about the most, my favorite easy uh, intervention that I teach all of the residents over at Children's, because we do some sessions with all of the pediatric learners, not just those in my global health pathway, is if you've ever used or you know someone with uh, asthma, we know that the best way to get those puff puffs in is through a spacer. Well, spacers, if you've ever had to pay for it, are super expensive. Um, but what works just as well is a 20 ounce uh, soda container. If you use the part that you drink as what goes in your mouth and you cut the bottom to uh, put that spacer in for mere pennies, and now most countries have plastic in them, they don't have just glass bottles, you have a great solution. 
Um, another one that we use is we do bubble uh, CPAP. So to provide positive pressure to help small babies breathe, uh, we use it just through some simple uh, tubes and using like um, when I teach the residents, I bring, I save all of my uh, like spaghetti can uh, glass containers and you put water in that and you can make a contraption that, you know, costs a couple hundred dollars for every patient that we use. So really simple things that that work well. Um, we talk a lot today about reverse innovation. What are some of these things that we're doing in low and middle income countries that cost a fraction of what they do in our healthcare system that we could use here? But there's a lot of stigma about using reuse things or things that aren't packaged and, and you know, um, advertised in the way that our kind of medical system works. But there's there's a lot of room to bring cheaper solutions back domestically as well. Thanks. That was a good question. Hey, uh, we have uh, some online questions. Here is one. How do bacteria and viruses cause fevers? Well, that's, that's a broad question. <laughs> Um, but there's some sort of infection. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, we, we're not going to get into the physiology and the biomechanics of it, but when something is off in your body, um, it, you mount an immune response. Um, and that can look different from a virus or a bacteria and the fever is part of what the body reacting, trying to activate that immune system. So if you think about people that are immune compromised, so be it you're on long-term steroids or you have cancer or some type of other chronic illness that because of the, the medical condition itself or the medications that you're on, your body can't fight back as well. That's why you're more susceptible uh, to infections because you can't mount that immune response and that fever or those are the same people who may be ill and they don't, they, their temperatures don't reach those higher numbers um, because their body isn't able to kind of respond in the optimal way. I think I'm going to leave it at that as a basic answer, unless you have anything else you would like to add after O'Connell. That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll take another question from this audience. And remember, you can ask anything about pediatrics and medicine is what I believe yeah. she offered. Hi, I wanna know why a low temperature is worse for a child or a person than a high temperature. A low temperature is worse for a child in a limited, uh, a low or middle income country than it is here. So it does show some type of, you know, some homeostasis is off. Something is not right. Um, but the reason it is a bigger deal globally than it is here is one, we have heat sources, we have interventions to help bring it back up. Um, and secondly, the average child born in a high income country is weighs more and, and has kind of more things going for them. They don't have as many risk factors for illness and just being kind of uh, small in size that that doesn't allow them to kind of bounce back or uh, respond to an illness in the same way. That's a very good question. Um, also, there's a follow-up. Yes. It, um, a high fever doesn't cause brain damage unless it gets to 108. Yeah. But low body temperature, but low body temperature on one of your slides, it said that it could cause yeah, and brain that's, damage. So that, you're paying very close attention. <laughs> I probably should have worded that a little better. So it's not that the low temperature in and of itself um, is more damaging. It's just the things that come with the low temperature that give somebody a less chance of survival. Actually, um, when people come in that are very ill or have kind of um, brain injuries, we sometimes cool people down. Um, to help keep their brain in like a safe place while they're getting over the traumatic brain injury. So cooling is, is not dangerous in and of itself. It's just kind of the links it has to all those other predictors of poor kind of growth and development that put small malnourished uh, babies in limited resource settings at higher risk. 
Thank you. And I don't mean to say that you can't get a temperature in a low or middle income country either. You certainly can. I just kind of took this talk and focused it more on hypothermia because I thought it allowed me to bring the link of a global health project in. Um, actually, in a lot of low and in middle income countries, there's much more algorithmic, kind of like that flow chart I showed you, use of antibiotics and much lower threshold to just give antibiotics off the bat because a lot of times it's not as skilled of healthcare providers that are those front lines seeing people at the health center or a community level. And so there are um, guidelines through the WHO that are much, we give out antibiotics much more aggressively in low and middle income countries than we do in the US uh, or other high income countries. And I think really over the next 10 years, we will work on really under kind of educating and helping make that differentiation between viral infections and bacterial, just like we did a couple decades ago here in the US, where we were over prescribing antibiotics a lot because overprescribing antibiotics does a lot of damage at kind of the, the larger community level, as well as it's really not good for, for developing immune systems either. I mean, appropriate use is good, but overuse can cause a lot of its own problems. Thank you. Another question from the audience. After seven to, day, to 10 days of a fever with no signs of improvement, should a provider draw labs? Yeah. So for us, seven days is our, our seven days. And that's a good point because it is seven, seven plus or minus a couple of days really is the point where you do need a bigger workup. Some of what that depends on is, has there been fever every day? Is the fever as consistent or rising versus like I was saying, the importance of using a thermometer? If there's fever on the eighth day, but it had reached 103 or 104 at the max and now is working its way down, I am I may give it a day or two more, but that's all with the discretion of being able to really see a patient and, and kind of assess them and use that gestalt that providers develop over, over a long time. So it's not as clear as like exactly a number, but that is exactly the range where we start to think about doing larger workups. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience here? Um, even though we're um, a first world country here, um, I don't know what the numbers are, but I've been reading that the infant mortality rate and the maternal mortality rate in this country, especially among people who aren't privileged socio socially economically yeah. um, has been um, increasing at a dramatic rate and kind of in keeping even with some developing countries. Um, what do you think is the, can you like put it in a nutshell what the main causes of that are? I mean, that's a, that's a longstanding trend and we have done worse and worse. And to your point, it is very stratified by socioeconomic background. It is not, it is not equal. Um, you know, I will say I'm, I, it's been a long time since I did any OB work and that really is kind of, you know, the OBs lead the charge on that. So really speaking to kind of what has in the last years, we've kind of plummeted more. What, what is contributing to that? I, I don't feel, um, knowledgeable enough to comment on. Um, but there's a huge discrepancy in prenatal care, um, between, privileged populations in our country and, um, you know, lower, lower income people that don't have access to care, um, because we have a lot of technology available in hospitals, um, and we should be doing a lot better. I mean, for a developed country, like we are, we are one of the worst. Um, so it is multifactorial, um, but, but you are right. I, I don't know that we are to any developing level countries, but uh, we, we are, it, it is pretty pitiful in our country. Thanks for that question. I think your colleague, a couple, did you still have a question? Two over? Yeah. I, I wanted to know how you can determine whether a child under three has a urinary tract infection. The only way to determine that is by a clean catch urine sample. So anyone that is not potty trained, the, the recommendation is a catheterized urine sample. Mm -hmm. And then with that, 
So that will show when you get a urinalysis back, we look for leukocyte esterase and nitrites are the things on a dip that we look for, um, but we run it under a microscope and look for true bacteria. And then you have to run a urine culture because you actually want to know the number of bacteria. That is the determination of a true urinary tract infection. And the urine culture is great because it also identifies what the bacteria that caused it. We know that E. coli is the most common. So you mentioned the age of three, really up to five or six in those potty training years, that front to back wiping, independent toileting, those are the, the biggest struggles as well as constipation. Kids are going to school. They don't feel comfortable, you know, um, defecating in places that aren't their home. Those are really the main reasons that we see kids in that age range, unless, you know, they have something underlying going on um, in their kidneys or their GU system. Um, but it does take those tests. And so, Treating just off symptoms is really not evidence-based medicine at all anymore. Right. And I was just wondering, I guess um, my real question is, uh -huh. what symptoms would a child oh. exhibit yeah. in order to even consider that? Pretty much the same things like you see in adult. Um, you know, it is that urinary frequency. It's the urgency to go, but just can't go. Um, but it also can be more generalized, it just can be fever, which is why like in those small babies, um, you know, or kids that have been sick for a couple of days, but aren't showing symptoms. That's why we do run a lot of urines because that is a pretty common cause of infection, um, that isn't showing as many overt signs. So yes, there are kind of the typical urinary tract infection symptoms, but it can be things that are much more generalized, just like fever, abdominal pain. Um, just kind of general unwell, you know, just not being, it, it, it is harder to, to tell. Because if you're on, if you can't verbalize your symptoms, Correct. Then how would you know in a child between, you know, you don't know, you treatment. don't know. And that's, it's usually why you've reached a point that things aren't improving. There's unexplained fever. And that's what leads us to do. That's kind of our first line of testing because to the, to your point, it's a pretty common infection. And then it allows us to pick it up. Most girls that are kind of the toileting age, we give them what we call one free urinary tract infection because it just is part of learning how to wipe and go. Um, but beyond that, you know, I think then we have to worry, is there something, do they have what we call reflux into the kidneys or is there something about their genital urinary system that is not working properly that's putting them more at risk for urinary tract infections? And the urine, uh, renal ultrasound usually being kind of that next step to investigate what's going on in those kidneys. Thank you. Many of our attendees are interested in themselves a healthcare career. So here comes a question. What can I do to become a neonatal nurse or pediatrician or what's a good way to start? Yeah, I mean, I think always just having exposure to the healthcare field. So, you know, if you're able to shadow or, or read or, or ask people that work in those areas, um, you know, there are many ways to kind of go about nursing. It depends if you're, if you have an undergrad degree um, or if you're kind of starting from, from, you know, scratch. Um, but, you know, there's many ways to work in pediatrics from, you know, being a nursing aide um, to just kind of get yourself in a ward and have exposure, um, you know, to there are, we have our nurses, we have our nurse practitioners, um, or our PAs, which are advanced practice providers, kind of the mid-level provider who work alongside myself and my colleagues, um, you know, to become a pediatrician, it is the, the road of undergrad medical school, and then three years of pediatric residency. But there are, there are many different ways to, to have an impact in the field without having to take that long road. Thank you. Um, audience here, any questions? Well, thank you. I'll stick around for a minute. So if you have any, we still have some oh. from online. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Keep, that's okay. Keep that's, answering. That's I'll, say okay. Otherwise, I'll also answer if you have anything that you don't want to ask in front of everyone. I'm happy to answer that as well. What is your recommendation for the right age for a child to get a COVID vaccination? 
Oh, I mean, I had my six month old lined up on day one. We were out at the bus. So as soon as they are eligible is my answer. Thank you. And then we have, does high altitude affect temperature? Um, well, I mean, other than it's colder at high altitudes and at high altitudes, you're going to have probably bigger flux in temperature over the course of a day, but not specifically. The thing that high altitude affects the greatest and was a big shocker training and living on the East Coast is your oxygenation. I had never sent a child home on oxygen in my life until I moved out here. And we do it regularly because little babies that get sick, um, you know, with our thinner air have a hard time breathing. And we often have to put them on some supplemental oxygen, uh, especially babies that are premature or just have, you know, risk are predisposed to having more kind of respiratory issues, asthma, bronchiolitis, things like that. So out here, it is pretty typical to, to send kids home on oxygen to help them get over acute illness. And you don't see that anywhere else in our country. Thank you. Uh, this question reads, this seems selfish, but can dream warmers be procured by US EMS systems for rural use? Would that help to lower the price point or increase it? Um, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it would definitely, the more, the greater distribution of use helps bring the price down. The thing that we've used in the US and it is used in other high income countries um, is those just like that there's those ice packs that you crack and they cool really fast. There's heat packs like that. And for EMS, there's also an electricity source. So there are a lot more out, uh, options if you have electricity. So while I think rural use is great, I think for our country, it's probably there are cheaper, better solutions. And last question from this. Uh, uh oh, oh, they're disappearing. What are fever dreams? Why do you sometimes get delirious when you have fevers? Is that caused by the fever or the pathogen slash illness? You know what? That's a good question. I always, I had a very disturbing recurrent fever dream as a child that my mom is sitting in the audience, so I can't share. Uh, but, uh, you know, actually, I don't know. I don't know the mechanism between the illness or the fever. I, I can't comment on that, but they are a real thing. So I will, I will, I would say Dr. Google can probably answer that one for you, but I don't, we, did, we didn't learn that in my pediatric training. That's a good question. I'm stumped. Wait, Hank. Oh, yes. That was the last question. 